przedstawić jeden z mikwiwych wykładów pod tytułem Sutra Sulangama, cztery jasne i niezmienne instrukcje czystości, powstrzymaj się od pożądania i zabijania, część druga z sześciu, między mistrzem a uczniami, udzielony w języku angielskim 22 grudnia 2018 roku. The working, working team. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I tell the contact person to put the working team in the trunk. So I can thank you. Uh, I want to thank you. Okay? I really thank you. Because working people have been uh, working under, you know, high stress, and they never complain. Working very happily, very unconditionally, dedicated, dedicated, yeah. And I want to thank you very much. It's a very big place. And you have no idea how much garbage they have collected. I come and go, come and go. I just see the garbage, more than people. <laughs> at the beginning, there are not too many workers. They work at the yeah, time pressure, because we try to make it before Christmas, try to make it before uh, this day, so that you can come together and sit, even though just under the tent. But this is our place. Is this really our place now? been working really, really hard. And normally, I, I tell the contact person to put them in the front today, the first day, so that they can be the first one to see. Of course, they have been seeing me sometimes when I come and go. It depends on what team at that day. But I want them to sit in the front today, because normally working people, like, for example, kitchen, yeah, or even the guard. They are the one who last to see me, if they can see at all. Because sometimes they are dispatched outside, and the outside gate, they have no chance to come here. Sometimes they, I come in different hours, and they have to stay in kitchen still, uh, completing their duty that day, so they have no chance. Maybe chance, but not always, you know, like you can always come to see me, but they are not. I really want to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and even they don't go to give meditation and see you on Sunday because they have to stay here and work. And when they first came, the place is very messy. 
and they can sleep anywhere and sometimes they work until they are late at night and if they late, yeah, when you already sleep, they are still working yeah, I can hear like sometimes they are very late and they work and on and eight, almost on eight. I am very proud of you I thank you and very proud of you I don't know if I were you, could I work so hard like that? Maybe I'm old already, I'm not sure about <laughs> But you work very hard. May God bless you. Buddha bless you. <laughs> Heaven bless you. And I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is it true? Dedication. Your pure heart is good. When I sit here, you cannot see. Okay, I stand up. Why don't make different? Don't make much difference in my size. My size doesn't make much difference whether or not I sit or stand. Well, I try to make the best of it. Okay. I even go high heels. Don't make me feel. Even high heels are good. Even high heels are good. I can do anything. When I was in Sibu before, I always treat the workers in all honesty, work with labor, hands, and like carpenter, structure, clean environment, I always treat them someday. Or someday, you know, like, they are the priority. And sometimes I treat also office people. But I like people who work not diligently. I mean, I don't mean office people are not work. I just mean and office job is more clean, cleaner and more comfortable. You sit in the shade or you sit in aircon or you sit with the pen. The people who work under the sun, under rainy conditions, in the cold weather, is different. You understand? I have always a uh, soft spot for people who have to work outside, uh, like labor, yeah? Uh, it's not just uh, our brother and sister who works hard. I always sympathize those who work outside. You know, there was some some Canadian uh, like aircon repairer. Yeah, he told me he has to work in Canada. Then where because they have, they have to climb into the attic sometimes, or working outside or under the basement, all kind of work. And the hands become like very stiff, they could not even move. But you cannot always use the glove. Because if you use the glove, you, you cannot handle some delicate bolt or screw or some very tiny part of the, you know, the machinery. And they say the hands sometimes are so cold, difficult to move and work, and they also call in such condition. Sometimes they have to crawl into some kind of uh, small space or tunnel to, in order to repair some machinery part. And I always have very sympathy, very much sympathy to this kind of people. I always thank them and treat them nicely, even those people who come to my house, outsiders, not, not outsiders, to repair my plumbing system, or uh, you know, water pipes, electricity, anything, I always treat them very, very nicely and I give them our tip and cook for them, bake for them, special. Normally I don't bake, but if they come, I also bake for them. If it's a special occasion, like their birthday, they have to come and watch and I cook for them and make a cake <laughs> and blow candles and stuff <laughs> so that they feel appreciated and respected, that they can go on you know, fighting with all kinds of difficulty in, in a difficult situation to continue to do their job with pride and with happiness. No wonder, you know, under the communism they they treat the labor 99%, right? <laughs> in America they say 99% those uh, <laughs> underprivileged. No wonder they treat the 99% good. I heard that like a long time ago, I went to China, and uh, there was a taxi driver, and, and I asked him if he's okay. He said, yeah, the government treat them well. If they don't have enough money, they always can rely on the government to support them. 
I like that kind of society. It's ideal society for me. Under what name, I don't mind. It's just that uh, we should not just take care of the body, comfort or uh, contentment only. We should also take care of uh, the spirit, yeah, the soul. Because look, when the soul's gone, we just stay like this, huh? You don't have to go to the mall. You sit before you go in there, pretty like this, huh? Therefore, we should know there is something inside that we should take care of before it leaves the body and make the body useless. That's why I always advise people, if your family member dies, just cremate them. So we save the, the land also, yeah? We don't pollute the land and all that. Also sometimes we ask for spirit, we make use of the body and make trouble for the living. Uh, if you die, you should cremate yourself, understand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got you. Funny wisdom, huh? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And this is, I bought it from my house. Hmm? Just now, the hoop I helped me to carry. I'm older. I should carry it to show you my respect and appreciation, but I'm not all that tough anymore. The hoop I help the God, yeah? It's helping me to carry it. It's for you. Yeah, for the workers only, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> only for workers. Got that? Because yeah. <laughs> there are too many people, so I would just uh, now put my love in it, and later the group leader will take it, and everybody take it by themselves. Not the group leader gift, okay? Well, maybe if you like the group leader blessing as well, extra, then you let me. Oh. I do it now, alone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, in case not enough, I also take care of this, okay? I'll for you. My house, only that much, okay? Yeah, they give me only that much. Yeah, but uh, we have some here. <laughs> yeah, we can take care of it. I take care of everything. Later, okay? Later. Too many inconvenience, yeah? Later. The group leader, right hand. Later, you bring and give to people. Okay. If you don't put the earphone, you cannot hear. There are too many languages here. Inside, I speak a language. Outside, some Spanish, broken, broken Spanish, uh, German. I don't know if it's good anymore. Uh, okay. Spanish. So, so, Vietnamese, 50 uh, 50. <laughs> and friends, uh, forget it. <laughs> All right, guys, I really love you. Thank you for coming. All of you, even if you did not work, I thank you for working at home. I thank you for working in the society, you know, taking care of yourself, uh, taking care of your family. That is a very big job. Raising your family, taking care of children, making sure they became a model of virtuous and goodness in, in the world is a very big responsibility and a lot, a lot of work. Yeah, okay. I told you it makes no difference, but I'm just trying to tell you that. <laughs> I try. <laughs> This place is a little bigger than Sihu, huh? And it's our place. Yeah. Uh, it takes like maybe around more than half a year to get it. Yeah. You are really my dear children. Very dear indeed. <laughs> Yeah.
You know this rule, right? At home, you have only several kids. You know how dear they are to you, right? <laughs> I have too many kids. <laughs> Big kids, small kids, old kids, young kids, middle-aged kids, teenage. <laughs> no age kids. <laughs> Not yet age at all, kids. <laughs> yeah. If you are working very well, diligently at home, and uh, taking care of yourself and your family well, I am also very, very, very grateful. Because that means I don't have to worry about you. That means the society uh, has uh, uh, better helpers to make it more beautiful, uh, livable, and more agreeable to everyone. Because if your children are born from vegan parents, they became also very vegan. Oh, mostly. And they will be also the ambassadors of compassion, peace, loving, kindness. When you take good care of them, you impart to them that ideal since they were young already. Read to them when they were still in your womb. Okay? Read to them. They understand everything. You read to them, you teach them already before they came to this world. And when they came into this world, of course you continue to teach them. And I thank all of you for that. And even if you don't have children of your own, but you live next to people, you have children, and your lifestyle will somehow influence them and make them a better uh, person, better neighbor. It doesn't always work, but you are there. At least you try. At least you make a good example. And I'm very, very proud of all of you. I'm proud of all of you. I know you don't always have time to come and help to clean the ashram, but never mind, whoever has time, they come already. And maybe the place is not yet 100% uh, the way you like, but it's okay, let it be. Yeah, let it be. It's better than uh, nothing. <laughs> Well, it's worth it, isn't it? Yeah. So it doesn't matter. We are all very rich anyway. Yeah, we are rich inside. The richness inside, money cannot buy. And money cannot sell. Nothing can destroy. Nothing can make it lessen. So that's the best richness that we can always keep. Yeah, now and hereafter. Good luck. And we are worthy of every penny, of anywhere, everywhere, anytime. I don't know anyone who are more worthy than you. Maybe maybe as worthy as you, but no one is more worthy than you. But anything that is accorded to you, you deserve it. You deserve it all. <laughs> Bravo to you. <laughs> To you, you are very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Praise yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, heaven also are uh, happy with you. Okay? If you think you are not up to it, then uh, try harder. Okay, huh? Try harder. And uh, sooner or later, you get there. Okay? Yeah. One make another better example, you follow the other another example, and then you make that example for others. Yes? I am just a little sorry that we didn't have it earlier. But you know the reason, right? You know the reason. Never mind, if you don't know, it's okay too. <laughs> it's okay too. Well, better than Thailand. That's right. Nice. <laughs> yeah. 
Better than the last time Pattaya we did, right? <laughs> okay. Maybe not as many fruits. <laughs> uh, you have enough food, by the way? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. If any of you still feel hungry or haven't found any food, just go to the kitchen and tell them I'm hungry. Okay. <laughs> You know, I think you just say I'm hungry. Yeah? I don't need Taiwanese. I don't need Chinese. I don't need any Japanese or any language to to tell people I'm hungry. Or do you? No. You just say. Mm. <laughs> huh? Yeah. <laughs> Even children. Before they talk, they already know how to tell the mother that they're hungry, right? <laughs> Mother understands perfectly, right? Yeah. Oh, you don't? You do? Your mother always understood that's why you grow so big. Huh? <laughs> that's the proof. Okay. I'm so happy to see you. And uh, we have just maybe as many people as uh, in uh, Pattaya, yeah? Or maybe more, or maybe less. But at least we have enough uh, toilet facility. <laughs> at least you don't have to plan. 16 floor. <laughs> no elevator even. Elevators are occupied, remember? Yeah. Wow, I'm glad. I'm glad you remember. So you will appreciate this place more. It's all flat. I don't have uh, many story buildings. Oh, that's one. Yeah, that one maybe <laughs> five story. And the other one two story. That's a mess. Okay? Yeah. And uh, they put you in different departments, different different places. But I say, come all here. Like this, at least you cannot see me at one time. I can at least walk around. Huh? I think some of you can see, right? Yeah. If in a room, then uh, just maybe 2,000 people see, or 500, 200. I ask them how many. 1,000 something. They told me the most sitting there. I say, how much is the most? They say, 1,000 something. I say, that's not the most. <laughs> because you are about 8,000, right? Uh, I know, 10,000, yeah? But that is not maximum, all right? Because we screen out some. Because I forgive. But I don't want to be reminded. If you forgive a snake, it's time for biting you, huh? for poisoning you with the bite. But you don't want to hug the snake all day long or keep it in your kitchen, no? Do you? No. Do you want that? No. no. okay. You forgive the snake. Yeah, okay, it's okay. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> don't bite anymore, but you will not uh, always uh, just try to be friendly and <laughs> compassionate to the snake and hugging him all day, huh? You want that? No, huh? Okay. So, love should go with wisdom. Okay? And forgiveness goes with reason. Because somebody told me, oh, Master, I feel like forgiving is like stupidity. Just people do bad things to you, and then you just say, okay, I forgive you, and then you continue business as usual. It's not like that. Uh, Buddha, Christ, advised us to be not among with such and such people. The same with other Same uh, a master. They advise you, choose your friend. Yeah, <laughs> choose who you be with. So that you became more purified, encouraged, yeah, and have more spirit to follow your righteous path. Therefore, forgiving is different than forgetting. Yeah, you can forgive and forget. But you don't have to always go find trouble to prove that you are compassionate or a big, big heart and magnanimous. I mean, big stomach, they call it. <laughs> that you can stomach everything. That we know for sure. But don't keep hugging the tiger after he wants to, to eat you, okay? For example, if you find the tiger to forgive him, it's fine, but don't, <laughs> don't try too hard or the poisonous snake. The snake's nature is like that. Maybe he changed, but maybe not. Huh? Don't risk your life just to prove that you are tough. Okay? We practice and we know ourselves. We know how tolerant we are, but there's no need to overdo to prove it. 
I also don't need to prove that I am a, a very tolerant and embracing everybody and all that. No, I don't need to prove nothing. You have to prove it to me that you have really learned from my teaching. But you call me teacher, right? You call me master. If an English teacher keep teaching the student, tell him, okay, you have to go home. Learn this lesson today, learn the grammar, try to write in English. Well, the person do nothing. Just sit in the class and making clown or making bad comments or, or criticizing a teacher or making trouble in the class. Uh, then the teacher should not be tolerant of that. Number one is troublesome for everyone in the classroom. That person don't have the right. Teacher also don't have the right to do that. To, to ruin the class. There are many students that are eager to learn spend their time and their money from their parents, etc., etc., to learn English. Well, that person is just staying there, just to make trouble. Then he has to go. After telling many times and still don't change, then must go. Otherwise, it ruins the whole learning atmosphere of other students, yeah, and tired the teachers down and wasting his or her time just to fix one person who is incorrigible then it is not very wise of the teacher. Although wasting his time instead of teaching the whole class a good thing and improving, he's just wasting time on somebody who's not really worth it. Even any sane sage would tell you, only the worthy one would really go to heaven. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, be pure, you will not enter the kingdom of God. He doesn't cheat you. He doesn't lie to you. He doesn't say, okay, come, come, come. I want more disciples, more, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people. The more disciples, the more prestige the master look like. He don't say that, see? Even though, you know, he could, yeah? He can do miracles and stuff like that. So he would just want to accept everyone. But you even tell them the truth. Accept. You become as a child. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Right in front of him already. People already see him, know him, and he still have to warn them that. Buddha say the same. For example, in this Surangama Sutra, the Buddha said many things about how his disciples should behave. Well, I, I have been studying it. It's a long time since I read it. I know approximately what is what, but I have to also select. Otherwise, if I read this to you, and knowing me, I'll talk forever, then we just take one sutra and uh, <laughs> until I die, I won't finish it. <laughs> but that's called expounding, you know, excuse. <laughs> I talk a lot. I don't know if you listen to any of them, but it's okay. I talk. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you like it, huh? You like it just standing there and talk no matter what? <laughs> before. We don't have this uh, marvelous earphone translating system, like a spontaneous translation system. Some people from foreign land don't understand what I'm saying. It's still, it's like, Master, stay. <laughs> we learned that word. Master, come, stay. <laughs> I said, you don't understand anything. Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> and some people listen to my song, singing in Vietnamese. Yeah. Sometimes they come and fetch me from the airport and they put in this Vietnamese song I sing all the time. So you you, you understand anything? And he sing it along with it. In Vietnamese? Yeah. And you understand anything? Uh, not really. <laughs> then why you listen to it? Very nice master. <laughs> as long as master sings it. I, uh, Okay, I want to... You want to listen to this sugar? Before, you know, I send TV, they always put a caption, like Buddha is vegetarian. So I corrected them. So now they put Buddha vegan. Remember, you saw that? Okay. Why? I tell you why. Normally, the, when the master uh, is alive, he can speak for himself. He can say, I'm vegan. Well, the master is already gone. So now they say anything. They put fish in a Jesus' mouth. They put pig uh, feet in a Buddha's mouth. They oh, say anything. The poor master is no more. 
and this is the world to talk. And who oh, to him if he come back to the physical world and say, look, I'm here, I'm the Buddha, I'm vegan, then everyone, what do you think they will react? Huh? They might put him in somewhere, you know, where, right? Okay then. Ah, yeah. I'm going to tell you that time. <laughs> Happy? Yeah. Good. You know what happened when a happy person become a Buddha? You know what happened? No. No? He become a happy Buddha. <laughs> what if he is miserable person and become a Buddha then? Miserable Buddha. We don't want that. Laughter is good for you. Good for the world, yeah? Because it brings happy energy. Infected other people with their uh, elevated vibration. Happiness is contagious, okay? Happiness, uh, smiling, laughing, other people happy is also a kind of charity. Because the world is already full of. Trouble and so if anytime we can laugh, it's a kind of good charity. Good deal. Yeah? You might go to a what heaven? Laugh in heaven. See, I'm all equipped. And before I read this, I had to. You know, first, scam it first. But the Buddha said many things, okay? And sometimes it's uh, not all necessary to tell you, you know, okay? Because sometimes I need to uh, use some authority figure. Now I can't see you. So. Who are you? Where are you? <laughs> because sometimes I have to quote some kind of authority figure so that you know. I say the same thing. And what I say, it doesn't go away from the ethical uh, standard or spiritual standard. Okay, now, there's, uh, there's so many things I could read to you, look at all this, but uh, I do one at a time, yeah? If we cannot finish due to my talking forever, then we do it next year again. <laughs> we should really thank the past masters, monks and nuns and scholars who had take time to record what the Buddha is teaching after the masters and nirvana. And also for the past and present persons, lay or monks or nuns who had really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas, past, present, and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you. According to Buddhism and the believer and the tradition, when you read sutra and all that, you have to put on incense, flower, you know, and bow to the sutra first and thank all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva in ten directions, all respectfully, before you read it, okay? And then you cover the sutra also with silk or, you know, beautiful cloth, and I just make it more popular, yeah, more easy, simple. And I apologize to all the Buddha. I say, if I've done something wrong, According to the tradition, my heart is full of respect. It's just that I cannot always do that. So please, all the sin, whatever I've done wrong, is all on me. At least other people, they hear the names of the Buddha, according to the Sutta, they will get benefit. Yes. I tell you some basic thing first, okay? And then later, when we have more time, we go deeper into how a practitioner could go in astray, yeah? From the spiritual path and fall into the demonic 
past, unaware, and even feel proud of it, and even feel righteous about it, and even lead others astray as well, due to your own misunderstanding, due to your own ignorance of the demonic influence upon your spiritual life. Okay? Even with the, um, the initiation, you still have to be aware. Okay? Otherwise, I just give you initiation and say, voila, you're done. No, I tell you, meditate every day. Step by step, you go up. It's better than go too fast. Huh? Go too slow in the highway, no good. Go too fast, also no good. And I also tell you to keep the five precepts. I don't say, okay, Master, all the powerful, you do what you want. doesn't matter. It does matter. Now, in this one, the Buddha uh, explained to Anand about just a simple, the five precepts. And you think it's nothing much. It is a lot. Okay? Even to the monks. So the Buddha is saying things here to the monks' assembly. But at that time, there were also dragons and divas and goats and demons of different kinds who came also to listen to the Dharma. I just tell you some part of the sutras only, okay? And there are many demons even came listen to the Buddha. And the dragons, yeah, and the divas from, from the uh, heaven as well as from the land and from the sea, from the water as well, okay, all kinds. Well, some of you see that in our uh, gathering sometimes, yeah? If, you, if at that time you're not sleeping, your eyes open and you can see, I mean, these eyes. <laughs> this I open all the time, see nothing. <laughs> you see only the illusionary of this world. The Buddha said this after Ananda has been explained about uh, different kind of practice. Yeah? Before that, different kind of practice, like uh, which Bodhisattva in former life or in this lifetime practice what kind of cultivation in order to be enlightened and become aha. There were about 20 plus, okay? Maybe another time. I mentioned it briefly sometime, long, many, long years ago. But just briefly, okay? If we have time, I will also tell you, all right? Now, the Kwani method is supposed to be the best, the most reliable, the quickest, and the best, according to the Buddha, okay? Therefore, you got that already, so we're not in a hurry to tell you other one, okay? So right now I'm telling you about demons, ghosts, <laughs> and devils. Are you scared? Uh, I am scared. After all the Bodhisattva told the Buddha, the uh, Buddha knows already, he just wants to ask each one of them expound their method of practice so that everyone in the assembly, including the divas uh, and the demon, also understand, yeah? Finally, the Kwani method is the best. The inner hearing organ is the best device to attain enlightenment and everlasting, reliable. Nothing can, um, can stop you when you, you do the hearing method, okay? Right. And then after that, Ananda asked the Buddha some more questions. So after he heard all this, and uh, many of uh, beings, they are limitless beings, they all brought forth a matchless, unequal resolve for anutta samyak sambodhi, mean for the highest aspiration, for the highest uh, enlightenment. Yeah, they all resolve, they are determined to want to practice until they get the best uh, the highest enlightenment. Understand? Like the Buddha. Oh. And then, after that, Ananda straightened his robe, this monk robe, and then bowed to the Buddha in the midst of the assembly and placed his palms together. At that time, his mind is perfectly clear. And he felt a mixture of joy and sorrow although he heard all that wonderful dharma has been expounded to them and the assembly and him. Why? Because he was a very compassionate monk. You must know, even though Anand was a disciple of the Buddha, but in Ian 
cowboy. Pax. He has already been Buddha. And just like Sekamoni Buddha, he also told that, oh, I have been a Buddha. Oh, countless, countless and paths already. So in order to help sentient beings, he has to reincarnate as a normal being. You know, sometimes even like a gecko, as I told you. Sometimes as a, in a spirit of even kusa grass, yeah, or a tree, or deer, a goose, etc., and human beings, of course, yeah, and also even kings of heaven. So he transmigrates, he's walking through all paths of existence from earth to heaven in order to make acquaintance to so affinity with all kind of beings in the existing world. Yeah? Similarly, Anand, though he humbly served the Buddha at that time as a not very enlightened attendant, his inherent compassion and wisdom has of course never been. Therefore, because of that, even though he heard the Quan Yin method was the best method and he has that already from the Buddha, his compassion steer him to ask the Buddha the following question, okay, the request. Now, what does he ask? Even though he heard all that, he still has half happiness, half sorrow. Why? Happiness because he has been with the best teacher having been transmitted the best method, why sorrow? Peace sorrow for other beings, for other sentient beings who has no chance to ever heard of the name of the Buddha, not to talk about being taught this kind of wondrous method, which you get after eons of thousands of, or a no, billion, trillion, endless kalpa. You don't just always get this meditation method, even though to some it seems easy, to Anand it's easy. Huh? He's next to the Buddha, he's a cousin of the Buddha, oh, of course he gets it from the Buddha. Yeah? And other already acquainted or affinity bear fruit already for them, they become Buddha disciples in that assembly. It's so easy. Not even all divas or dragon king or king of heaven would hear this method. Not all of them. It depends on what kind of merit they cultivated long ago in former life. So he was very sad. Ananda was sad, even though he was happy. So he has this mixture of feelings. So his intent was to benefit all beings in the future as he made obeisance and said to the Buddha, Greatly compassionate world honored one, I have already awakened and received these teachings for becoming a Buddha. Ananda saying that. And I told you, yeah, he's a compassionate person, compassionate monk. And I can cultivate it without the slightest doubt. I have often heard the first come one. Now you often hear me say the first come one for when I read the sutra for you or Buddhist story, yeah? Do you know what first come one mean? Me not come, not go. Mean he's here, but he's everywhere else. Yeah. Or he's here, but in, he, he's also in a different dimension. Even though he's here, he has been, or he always present. He's always present in different dimensions. Even though officially, or look like, for everyone at that time, he had just become enlightened some years ago, under the Bodhi tree. After meditating and six years and forty days sitting under the tree, no eating, no drinking, then became Buddha. Yeah, don't try that. It's not because of that you became Buddha. He has, he has been a Buddha all the time. Okay, because if you don't eat, you don't drink, and became Buddha, then all the people who are poor has no food, no drink, has become Buddha a long time already. I just want you to be clear. Your concept has to be correct. Otherwise, if you sit all the time and you don't have really correct understanding, it's not too much use. And then you don't tap up so easily. I saw some have kind of stamping their feet in one place. And I hope those uh, will catch up soon. 
So he say that he has received the teaching from the Buddha and he can cultivate without the slightest doubt. He continued, I have often heard the thirst come one say, yeah, thirst come one because even though he became just a Buddha, but he has always been, okay? He has always been the Buddha. And even though he stay in the samsara, the world, but he is always in the nirvana. He never like, okay, he leave the world and go to nirvana. It's not like that. It just seems like that, only in this illusionary world. But he never go, never come. Never cultivate, never become Buddha, nothing. He has been always Buddha. That's why the practitioners, the enlightened one, they saw that, they know that. So they address him as first come one. It's one of his titles. It's just like they call him world honor one, or just like they call him compassionate master, yeah, Maharaji, okay? Maharaji means king of king. This is some of the problem when people call a master like that. Because they predicted before Jesus born that there will be a great person born to be a king of the Jews. So now, like, like that, they predicted that the king of the Jews will be born soon. Or in a certain and such day, a such and such year. That's why when, at uh, that year when Jesus was born, with many other infants, the king of that land wanted to find all the infants and kill them all. That's why Jesus' mother and adopted father has to escape, brought him to another land. Otherwise, why? He's just an infant. He did nothing. He did not even speak yet and had to run already. Imagine the life of a master. And therefore, when he was born already, and he became adult, and he learned, and he meditated, he became powerful already, they still want to kill him. Therefore, no need to make any excuses. They just nail him no matter what. They even forgive one of the sinners, one of the, the criminal instead of Jesus, the real criminal, who does did harm to society, like some of criminals. They forgive him, let him free, let him go free. But, kill Jesus. For nothing. For that he done nothing. Now you understand why? Because of that name. King. King of kings. Maharaj. But they call their master like that. You are the king of kings. More than kings. Yeah? That's not the master who wanted that way. Even if he wanted that way, so what? He is the king of kings. Above any kings in this world. Right? Yeah, Jesus was the king above any king, before, now, after, forever. Okay, so because of that, <laughs> many of Indian masters also have problem because in India they call the master Maharaj, Maharaji means king of king. They address the master like that, of Paramhansa, of Paramsan, mean saint of all saints, of Maharaj, king of all kings. That, that, that is a name that makes trouble for the master. Because all the kings are jealous, worried. Yeah? Having fame, power, fortune is a curse in some, uh, in some ways. Yeah? For some people. If you don't handle well fame, fortune, and power, then you'll be in trouble. This power will become like a two-edged knife and will destroy you in the end. For what for? The king was so worried. He kill all the innocent first-born babies. Babies at that time, yeah? Poor Jesus. Infant. Going to be born. Not yet born even. Have to run. Have to leave. The parents have to leave their home. Their environments, their uh, familiar hometown where they can make money, earn a decent living and dignified, you know, position in the world, they have to run. For what? That is because fame, power and richness, you know, blind people. People who have no virtue, who have no spiritual practice, who doesn't know right from wrong. Then, that will kill them at the end. 
It doesn't kill them maybe by gun or by knife, but it will kill them at the end, and they will go to hell. It is like that. It's full of hell is full of this kind of kings or leaders. They just don't know. So you, I talk a lot. <laughs> Are you okay, Sil? Yes. All right. All right. Your fault. <laughs> Your fault, not mine. Like disciple, like master. <laughs> when you go out, you also preach to a lot of people. You love to share your wisdom with them. <laughs> One time, uh, some of the Vietnamese tell me also, they want to come and offer me service, you know, they say one of their family member or two family member would like to come. The Vietnamese people in America a long time ago and in Europe, they told me, oh, we should come and serve you, please let us. I said, no, I'm, I'm alone, I don't need a lot, I'm fine, I'm fine alone. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't need to trouble you, you know, you have your own life and you must, you know, be in, outside in the world, enjoying your freedom and do what you do. Oh, but you are the king, Master, you are the king. She don't say such a thing anymore, please. <laughs> okay, that's the thing I want to run away from, huh? To, to stay away from. Understand? That name, Maharaj, kills many masters already in India and other countries. Don't ever call me that. Yeah, I think it's seldom. Maybe thank God. Sometimes I see people outside and they say, "Oh, you are beautiful." I said, oh, so old already, that's the wrong word to use for an old woman. He said, oh, age doesn't matter, it's just a number. I said, yeah, yeah, a lot of numbers, wrinkle numbers. <laughs> I can count it, yes. Oh, you, I talk a lot. <laughs> We're making it happy, no? Yes. Otherwise, I can read it quickly. I can read, not that I cannot. So you want me to read it? I want to become a Buddha, but it's 50 years, 20 minutes. Finished. <laughs> you like that? Okay, good. Then I become my habit yourself. Mm. So, uh, Anand said to the first come one that uh, I have often heard the first come one. Buddha has many titles, okay? First come one, and the enlightened one, and the king of the world one, compassionate doctor, all kind of name. They address the Buddha for respect, and according to their experience, you know? After what the Buddha bestowed on them, spiritually and physically, they call him that, yeah? But maybe they're sick, and, uh, and the Buddha healed them, because they pray to the Buddha, and the Buddha healed them, even though other doctors cannot. Then they call him the king of all the doctors. Ah, <laughs> make trouble. <laughs> all the doctors, the war doctors, something like that. Okay? Now, so I have heard the first come one say that uh, we should save others first, then save yourself. That is the aspiration of a bodhisattva. Once your own enlightenment is perfected, then you can enlighten others. That is the way the first come one responds to the world. Although I am not yet saved, Ananda, I vow to save all living beings in the Dharma and in age. He continued, World Honor One is another title of the Buddha. You see, like Jesus is enlightened master, but also called Maharaji. I mean, the great king or the son of God. Yeah. I wonder why God have only one son, and who are we then? <laughs> are we adopted or something? <laughs> of course, I respect Jesus, but I am jealous, okay? I am daughter of God too, yeah. <laughs> In one hand, they say, we are all children of God. And the other hand, they say, Jesus, the only Son of God. What is that, huh? Mm. But nevertheless, He is worthy of that. We are only children, a son or a daughter of God, if we truly follow God's command, follow God's way of life, follow Jesus' uh, advice to live a noble life. 
Is that not so? Yeah. That's why Jesus said, when, uh, when he was addressing the assembly somewhere, and they said, oh, your mother, your sister is coming, or oh, a father is coming, brother coming, where we say, who am I? Family. Only those who follow my teaching. Something similar like that. So now, Ananda continues. World honor one. Those living beings will gradually drift away from the Buddha. And there will be as many brilliant teachers, mean they uh, go away from the path. They're not going straight, not the true teacher. As many brilliant teachers propounding their methods as there are sands in the Ganges. Wow. No wonder I have only 10,000 people here. Hmm? <laughs> we have to share with so many, as, as many as Ganges sands teachers. Whoa. How did you find me? Huh? <laughs> In such numerous sand dunes and sands, uh, however, whatever, yeah. You know how much sand is in the Ganges River? Or on the beach of the Ganges River, you know how much? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you can ever count. So many. And, you know, false teacher in this world. So difficult to, you know, go to the right one, huh? Difficult, yeah. Especially when you're not yet enlightened, you don't know what is wrong, what is right, okay? So I'm telling you from the Buddha, hmm? he's been on, a, you know, since 2,000 plus years, so he cannot go wrong. Jesus also. So now he say that uh, so many brilliant teachers, yes, as there are sands in the Ganges, the Ganges River, yeah? Okay. I want to enable those beings to collect their thoughts and enter Samadhi. We want to help other beings. So how can I cause them to reside peacefully in a Bodhi Manda, in, in the determination to follow the Buddha teaching? to become a Buddha, okay? To elevate yourself into the same So that's a Bodhi Manda. Far from the exploits of demons and be irreversible in their resolve for Bodhi. Bodhi means for enlightenment, okay? Help people in the future. How is he going to do that? He said he wants to. Because the people will be distracted, yeah? Or sidetracked and following a false teaching. And it is very difficult for them then to uh, be steadfast, the steadfast on the enlightening road, yeah, and position. So at that time, the war honored one praised Ananda in front of the whole assembly, saying, good, good indeed, how good it is that you have asked how to establish a body manda and to rescue and protect living beings who are sunk in the morass of the final age. Listen well now and I will tell you. So Ananda and the great assembly agreed to uphold the teaching. It means whatever the Buddha tell them, they will uphold. They will listen and uphold. So the Buddha told Ananda, You constantly hear me explain in the Vinaya that there are three unalterable aspects to cultivation. That is, collecting one's thought constitutes to the precept. It means you have to keep the precept. Okay, that's number one. And then because from the precept becomes samadhi, it means you be established in tranquility, in the non-reversible enlightened state of being. That is samadhi. Not just when you sit cross leg and uh, your soul leave your body, go to the uh, high heaven. It's not just that, okay? It is your establishment in the enlightening in a state of being and non-reversible, okay? 
Well, according to my humble opinion, <laughs> my Buddha didn't say that. I, I say that. So if it's wrong, don't blame the Buddha. Huh? I told you I can talk a lot. Hmm? <laughs> there was a joke I told you before, huh? There was a priest in, in the church. He can talk a lot. So then, one day he apologized to his congregation because he realized that he talked a lot. Oh, so he said, oh, sorry, I, I forgot my watch at home. You know, meaning he talked a lot, he didn't realize how many hours passed. So one of his congregation men said, there's a calendar behind you. <laughs> Don't worry about what the calendar is there. Okay. So you can tell me that whenever you have it, okay? That's why I don't see you a lot, because I know <laughs> I know my limits. I don't always say my welcome, eh? Maybe that's one reason. <laughs> that's the one, eh? Because if you keep the precepts well, then you can enter Samadhi. Why is that? My humble opinion again. It's not here. I told you I can't expound things, talk a lot. You can tell, put a calendar behind me next time. <laughs> they have a, a clock all the way in, in front of me all the time, remember? So that I remember when you should go to eat, when you should go to sleep, <laughs> when you've had it. Is I talk only about one hour now, right? Not even. Huh? Not much, is it? No need calendar yet. <laughs> okay. Then, why is that? If you keep the precept, then you can be more established, more stationary in your uh, enlightenment in your enlightened uh, state of, uh, of being. Why is that? Anybody know? It all distracts you. It all, it leaks out when you, when you break the precepts or, or when you involve yourself in it. it. It just, it pours out and you can't, it's like a balloon with holes in it. Mm. Yeah. Good. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> you know that word too. Believe in Korean. <laughs> He's not Korean, but he knows. <laughs> okay. It's very good like that. It's like a leaking tank of water. It's like a whole holy balloon. <laughs> holy balloon. Has a hole in it. God slowly the air from that. Yes. But you are not protected. You see. The precept are for your protection. Yeah. The precept is the thing you should not do. It actually should not be a precept because it should be a natural of your being, of a noble being. Yeah. So of course, if you are a noble being, then you respect everyone as yourself. So how are you going to harm somebody else? Because that's like harming yourself. Right? We are all one. Then, or if you love someone so much, if you love other people, if you have compassion, then you could not harm other people. If you do, that means you have no compassion, or very little, or less, okay? Then, of course, <laughs> you cannot enter somebody. That is one. And if you steal from somebody else, then, of course, then you also don't treat others as the way you like to be treated, yeah? Or if you tell lies, something like that. That means... You're lying to yourself. Hmm? You don't respect the the person that he has intelligence at all. That's why you lie. Okay? Then you also not good. Actually, the Buddha will, will talk more about this kind of precept afterward. Okay? So I don't want to go ahead and to spoil the fun. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. So after you keep the precepts well, then you are more established in your enlightened, uh, uh, I would say, status, right? And then after you have samadhi, meaning you are stationary in your enlightenment, then you have wisdom. That's what the Buddha said here, okay? It's not, I don't need calendar, yeah. And wisdom is revealed out of samadhi. So after you, you keep the precept, you have somebody. After you have somebody, you will have wisdom. Therefore, the precepts are number one, no? Yeah, good. These are called the three non-outflow studies. It is like outflow means leaking, okay? 
Mm-hmm. You see, non leaky study. Meaning, if you keep the precept, then you have samadhi. When you have samadhi, you will have wisdom. It's not the normal knowledge, but the wisdom of the enlightened of Buddha, yeah, of sainthood. The wisdom of the higher dimension, of the uh, elevated heaven wisdom. So it's very good to keep the precept, yeah? That's why I always emphasize, when before you have initiation, I have asked you to keep the five precepts. Remember that? Yeah. How easy for me to keep? Huh? <laughs> for you, huh? I also keep, of course, I also keep. So, the Buddha continues. Ananda, why do I call collecting one's call the precept? You know, that's in one point. Yes. So, collecting thoughts are like precepts. Because if you always concentrate on your cultivation, whether sitting, laying, because if you always have one pointedness in your mind, you will not feel distracted by any of these temptations around you, or anything that is not pleasant to your liking, or to your mind, or your eyes, or your ears, you will not think about it, right? You concentrate always on the holy name, of concentration on goodness, virtues, just remember all that and you just forget of every other thing. That's why the Buddha say, uh, collecting thoughts, meaning collective of this concentration, uh, one-pointedness, is as good as precept. Yes, like that. But of course, concentrating on nirvana, on wisdom, on uh, Buddha's teaching, yeah? Not concentrating on, you know, other things. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That I don't have to tell you. Yeah, that you know very well. <laughs> that world is tough. Hmm. So, Ananda, why do I call collecting one's thought the precept? Because if living beings in the six parts of any mundane world had no thought of lust, they would not have to follow a continual succession of birth and death. You see? Now the Buddha beginning to ex- expound on each one of the precepts. The one that he referred to here first of all is lust. Lust is physical. Lust, lust also um, for sensation. Lust is not only that. It may be lust for power, okay? Lust for richness and just trying so hard or going too much in that direction that you forget heaven, you forget to cultivate, you forget to concentrate on some some virtues and some moral or to help others, nothing. You just want that, you see, richness or the, the bodily satisfaction. That's also lustful. No. So the Buddha thinks if, if you collect your thoughts away from lust, then you never have to be, you know, Reincarnate again and again into the suffering world as ours or others. The next one, Buddha continues, huh? Your basic purpose in cultivating is to transcend the wearisome defilements. But if you don't renounce your lust for thought, you will not be able to get out of the dust. Meaning, you will not be able to uh, be free, liberated from the circle of life and death, eh? always rolling in the dust of this world or the next. So here he emphasized that we should always concentrate in the opposite way of lustful uh, intention. The world honor one continues. Even though one may have some wisdom, even if you have lust for thought, okay, and you meditate, and you have samadhi, or you have some samadhi, or you have some cultivation, but, and then you have some fruit out of that. So the Buddha say, even though, you know, with lust for thought, even though one may have some wisdom and the manifestation of chan samadhi, then you can probably stay in samadhi for some time, yeah, if you meditate, and, uh, even if with lust for thought, you might still gain some wisdom and samadhi. 
But if one does not cut off lust, one is certain to enter demonic path. Oh, scary. Okay. At best, one will be a demon king. You know, powerful, really demon king. It's not normal king, huh? Very powerful. A lot of magical power, a lot of retinues, a lot of moving mountain and earth. Oh, he can do a lot of things. But demon king is not a joke. Very powerful being. Okay. So, but, that is not Buddhahood, you see? So, he say, if you have lustful thought and you don't cut it off, you don't try to control it, then the best you would be is a demon king, not Buddha, no? not Bodhisattva, not the same. Buddha said, not me, don't look at the calendar. This is what he said. I read it. <laughs> So at best one will be a demon king on the average. If it's best a demon king, averagely one will be in the retinue of demons. You know, the demons subordinate. At the lowest level, one will be a female demon. Huh? <laughs> Even in a demon, demon world, they have races. Huh? So the... The, the worst it is a female demon. I don't know what's the difference between a female and a male demon. I really don't. These demons have their group of disciples, even. Wow. See that? It says of himself that he has accomplished the unsurpassed way, meaning the highest method, the highest, I uh, mean, they already became a master of enlightenment somewhat, you know? And they, all of them proclaim like that. These are the disciples of the demon king. Uh, not just a demon king, but even this female uh, demon, he didn't say only a uh, demon king. That means that all the demons will have disciples and they also claim all of them became a Buddha already, uh, something like that. Okay, continue. Buddha. After my extinction, in the Dharma and in age, these hordes of demons will abound, spreading like wildfire as they openly practice greed and lust. Claiming to be good knowing advisors, they will cause living beings to fall into the pit of physical love and views and lose the way to Buddha. In the love the way to enlighten. The Buddha continues. When you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must first of all sever the mind of lust. This is the first clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the third come ones and the Buddhas of the past. Were honor one. It's all mean Buddha, no? meaning all the past Buddhas, even also taught this way. Hence the Thai precept. Okay? If you're married, it is not counted in here. But when you're married, of course, uh, after a while it becomes, you know, like more and more like friendship. Okay? That is different. It doesn't mean uh, counted in here as the lust of mind. <laughs> Because, as I told you, lust doesn't only mean the uh, desire between man and woman. It's desire for power, for richness, abnormally. Not just a normal way, like, okay, you graduate. Of course, you want to come out and find a job according to your education and your ability. That does not mean, like, lust after power. And if you go into politics and people incidentally voted for you to be a president, then you become president. <laughs> Then it's okay. If you want to renounce your presidency, okay, nobody say anything. If you want to become, or continue to be president, then it's okay too. It's the way you are destined to be a president, or a king, or a company millionaire, or whatever. Then it's your destiny, okay? Of course, in your job, you do all your best to be successful, okay? But that doesn't mean less after power, okay? Less after power is when you disregard all moral uh, standards, all virtues, 
to their limit, okay? And to shut down everyone else in order to climb up to the, the ladder of fame. That is different. So in your job, you do your best. That's normal. And whatever becomes, become. okay? You don't aspire to do your best so that you become a, a president of the company or anything. It's, then it's different, okay? Yeah. Just do your best because it's your job because it's our service to others. And if you are, of course, uh, if you don't do your job, you are monks and nuns, and you do your job as monks and nuns, the best. Oh, do the best. You keep the precept, you keep yourself pure, yes, and you continue your path uh, one-pointedly, and then you teach whoever come to you, yeah? Then you teach them moral virtues, meditation, whatever you know, yeah? That is also uh, your job. But it's not ambition, not lust after power, okay? Only when you want people to worship you, when you are nobody yet, and you are not having anything, you don't contribute, but you want people to contribute to you or worship you, that is wrong. Hmm? It's wrong as a monk or none. And the Buddha will explain more later on about this kind. Okay? I'm worried about the calendar, so I, I, <laughs> I will limit to my thoughts. <laughs> but we're almost at the end of the year, so it's okay. <laughs> I'm not so worried so much. <laughs> you know, I'm sad. Every day, almost every day, nowadays I don't have a lot of time to write my, my, my uh, diary every day anymore. Sometimes I know something uh, inside have some insight, some vision, but I have no time to even write it down anymore. I write maybe once every three, four days, or once every week, you know. It depends. Depends if I have time, truly, regretfully. And then I look at the calendar, I mean, my <laughs> the calendar in my diary, and I, I'm so sad. I say, my God, it's already almost the end of the year. I'm older now. I feel like nothing happy about it. Huh? Good I don't celebrate birthday, although I keep reminding me every year, you know, no escape. <laughs> like this, I still can feel that I'm still young. <laughs> Only number. <Yes>. Number. <laughs> Continue, the Buddha. When you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must, first of all, have the mind of lust. This is the first clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the first come ones and the Buddhas and the world honor ones of the past. You know, he teaches the same, like all the Buddha. This is a teaching, it should be given to people. Therefore, Ananda, if cultivators of Chan Samadhi do not cut off lust, they will be like someone who cooks sand in the hope of getting rice out of it. After hundreds of thousands of aeons, it will still be just hot sand, and no matter how long you cultivate it. If your concept is not right, you know, as the Buddha thought, then you will be nothing, get nowhere. Just like cooking sand and hoping to get rice out of it. Why? The Buddha continued. Why? It wasn't rice to begin with. It was only sand. Well, why do I know that? You know that, right? <laughs> if we cook sand, it won't be rice. So, if you seek the Buddha's wonderful person and still have physical lust, then even if you attain a wonderful awakening, it will be based in lust only. With lust at the source, the source, you will revolve in the three paths and not be able to get out. What are the three paths? Anybody remember? Buddhist? What are the three paths? Hmm? Huh? You can... Okay, the... Yes. Okay, she say... The three paths, including being the, uh, uh, you know, animal and the hungry ghost 
and hell. This is the path that you have to walk through if you cultivate based on lust. Oh, so scary. Not just like practice and then easy to become Buddha. Eh? There are so many traps around and there are more. You know, look at all this. Other. I, I mark it off for you here. I mean, I don't just mark it's on not all here. I mean, this is the beginning of that. And that is at the end of that. So I mark only two times. Huh? I had to read all this in order to select out for you some. You see that? Yeah? Okay. And this is not yet the, the January of the calendar. <laughs> it's just <laughs> December. <laughs> yes. All right. So the Buddha continued. With lust at the source, you will re- revolt in the three paths and not be able to get out. Which road will you take to cultivate and be certified to the first come once nirvana? He asked, meaning if you continue to frolic in the lustful kind of attitude and mind, then you will not. How can you get to nirvana? He continued. You must cut off the lust which is intrinsic. You know, inherent even, in both body and mind, for human. Then get rid of even the aspect of cutting it off. At that point, you will have some hope of obtaining the Buddha's body. Hope whom you even get. You know, after you cut off all the last meaning, concentrating on avoiding all these lustful or thought or attitude or mind or thinking, then after that you still get rid of trying, meaning it becomes like your nature, okay? And you don't even think of trying to cut it off because you have no more lust. And you forget about it already. Still, at that point, you still have some hope, A-O-P-E, hope to attain Buddha body. Body means enlightenment, okay? Yeah. Oh. You want me to continue? Really? (laughs) It seems so hopeless. (laughs) After doing all that, this is just hope. Okay. And where are we all going? Huh? You and I. Huh? It's okay. It's okay. There is, there is hope. Okay. And life may be seems difficult. Avoiding temptation does seem to be difficult. But if we know we have it, we still can be redeemed. If we know, okay, I'm having lustful thoughts, cut it off, okay? Try to cut it off. At least you know. You know, okay? At least you know. For example, you know that you're sick. Yeah? You're sick already. What to do? At least you know you're sick. Okay? Then you will find a way to cure yourself or go to doctor or talk to somebody who can help you. You see? There's always some remedy. Just be mindful of what you think, of what you cultivate in your stupid mind. Ah, sorry. No. And not intelligent. <laughs> the mind is not your fault. The mind has been born like that. Too much trouble. Hmm? Just following the world. Yeah? Only the soul is truly wise and intelligent. Yeah? And good. And virgin. And whatever the best you think of. That is so inherent. And here we have physical body. And we have the mind. We have the brain. This also the Buddha said inherently we will think lust for thought. Yeah, the hormones, the society, uh, infection, the example of others, the camp- company we mix with, the work we're doing, the picture we see daily, okay, the people we contact. All these are there just to make us struggle. So just know that, okay? And try your best. Always.
think the opposite way. Remember the five holy names. Remember to pray to all the saints, the master, to help you. Then it's okay. Yeah? It's not as okay as if you don't have. But we try our best. And our heavens know how difficult it is to live in this world and be like a pure lotus in the mud. How difficult that is. Even if you don't want to have any lustful, for example, relationship, somebody come along and try to slap you around until you give in. Because uh, maybe you feel sorry for that the guy or girl trying too hard. Maybe you're just lonely at that time. Maybe you've just gone through a difficult period of your life. <laughs> maybe you just lost your job. Or maybe you just gone through the winter of your spiritual cultivation. And maybe you just lost some loved ones and you're just lonely, you just weak and something come attack you. This is a Maya. The Maya will use anything to attack you. Not just person. Huh? Use anything at all. Creation, creation, problem, please. So, be merciful to yourself. Just be aware, okay? Do not try to condemn yourself too hard. You're only human. We are only human, okay? Well, I don't mean you are human. I mean you have human body. And the human body, human brain, are source of our illness. If we don't take good care and be alert and knowing what they're doing to us. Not that? Yes. Knowing our weakness. So we can forgive ourselves and strive to be stronger. Huh? Okay, not spoiling us, not indulging in our weakness. And it's all right. Truly, I don't think God and Buddha would be so heartless, no compassion as to condemn us to the point, because we are really thrown into a sea, tight, hand and feet, and had to swim to survive. It's like that. Just know it, okay? Beware, all right? Beware. And try to control it as much as you can. That's why all the other great people, they say the best victory is conquering yourself. <laughs> because it's too hard. It's too hard. Yes. And then you must work for your life, yeah? You must take care of your family, your parents, and every other thing. They take all your time already. We have only 24 hours. And we need to sleep 8 hours. Oh, more or less. And we have to cook. We have to go shopping. We have to eat. We have to take care of our clothes. We have to pay tax. We have to drive car to work. Drive by insurance. Oh, God. Truly, if I am still in the world, like you are, with husband, wife, children, I'm not sure if I could even meditate as good as you do. Good for Buddha that he left the whole kingdom, left for 500 concubines, yeah? 500, but that's a fixed number in India, I told you. That could mean 200, it could be 50. I mean, a lot, <laughs> many, many. They always say 500, 2,000. <laughs> You know, uh, 84,000, I, I explained already last time. Like so, I'm not trying to condemn you ever, okay? I feel really, really that you are worthy of admiration and respect. I truly feel that way. That you are so strong, so tough. Such a world you live in. So many things binding you. So much stuff to distract you. So many, many temptations to bind you. So much obligation on you. And you still want to practice and meditate and go to good meditation and go to charity events, helping me with SMTV. Cleaning the ashram for everybody, etc., etc. You really earn a place in heaven.
Well, I really, really love you. Even the least of you. Even you can't meditate very well. I do love you. Because I know the second world is like that. I don't know how anyone can survive here so long with all this surrounding, you know, tiring job and obligation and temptation and work and whatever, yeah. And physical body demand, you know, and physical body weakness and the mind struggle, the mind's weakness and the surrounding company, you know, not all of them are good for you. Yes. And once you make a mistake, it's difficult to go back. You know, it just keeps binding you and one leads to another, another. <laughs> you say somebody doesn't want to get married, you know, to begin with. But then he or she got married, and somehow got married. And then it's not ending there, had children. <laughs> and then work harder. Yeah, work harder. And more, more anxiety, more worry because of the kids, because of the love for the kids. I don't mean that is a bad thing to have children or anything. What I mean is that it probably wasn't the thing you want to begin with. And then you cut me to it. And you can't get out. Just get more and more trouble. More children, and then later more grandchildren, and more whatever. And then the in-laws together, and, uh, you know, the trouble that brought me. It's a package deal. It's a package deal. It's not just one person coming to your life. It's many things. The wives and husband friends, the wife and the husband family, wives and husband, you know, all the not so good company, yeah, etc., 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 and the colleagues and the boss. Oh, God. Ah, I really think you are tough guys. Tough, tough, tough. You are made of iron. I should call you uh, Iron Initiate. <laughs> How you do all this? I don't know. I had only uh, seven dogs and uh, several, maybe tens of thousands of disciples, and I'm already very tired. <laughs> and how you do all this? And disciples are mostly very good. Yeah? All right. No, I truly, really, really love you, because I know what you go through every day, every single day of your life. Even if you try to avoid one, they still will get another. The Maya is always around. He never leaves you alone. He doesn't leave me alone. He can't mess up with me. He mess up with my, you know, attendants, uh, assistants, actually dogs' assistants. Every day. Every day. <laughs> if I cannot cry, I just laugh. What else to do? Cry and laugh is the same. <laughs> same situation. Yeah. <laughs> you are in prison already. You cry or you laugh. What would you do? <laughs> You're in prison, right? <laughs> Make no difference. Just as I told you. Yeah? I wear high heel and I stand up. <laughs> so not much difference to you. They don't see me much. <laughs> right. Now, I told you. I talk a lot. You need a calendar now? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Hey, it's all your fault. You don't want me just to do different reasons. You want me to talk, talk? <laughs> Never mind, we have fun. Okay? We have fun. Yeah, whatever. Okay, huh? You already have Ning Method. You already know the five precepts. What else can be wrong? Hmm? And you want to see your master. Can it be wrong? No, right? So she has to sit here so you can see her, right? And if you can not just sit here for just uh, look, look, look for her to talk <laughs> Entertain you, huh? Yeah, you should be lucky you have some entertainment, Master, no? Yeah. 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 All right, my ego is going up already. <laughs> All right, so the Buddha say that what I have said here, I mean above mentioned, just up to now, apart from mine, yeah, except mine. You say what I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. Any explanation others 
counter to it, mean opposite to it, is the teaching of the papilla, meaning the atheist. Meaning it's wrong. Yeah? What the Buddha said about the last four mind, you know, that we should cut off, we should be aware of it. Just be beware of it. Okay? Then that is the teaching of the Buddha. He didn't say be beware of it. I, I say that. Because the Buddha has it too good. Maybe he doesn't know much about the suffering of normal humans. So he said, you have to do it or die. Well, I tell you, beware. Beware and control. Buddha has been born as a prince. Huh? And he has been a Buddha forever. He tops guy, right? Prince. Muscular. Hmm? And 500 concubines. Huh? Born in silk and silver and gold. And even he went out after a few years, he became Buddha again. <laughs> and people worship him. Whatever he say, people listen with awe, respect. Yeah? So, he probably never had to work all his life. Huh? Of course, it's his good karma, good marriage. You could cultivate. Well, and then you can become a king and then a prince and a Buddha like that. If you cultivate the Bu- what the Buddha said. Okay? Right. So the Buddha has cut off his tie with the world. As a, as a prince, he was so well protected. He lived in luxury. Yeah? He lived in protection, love, and respect, worship, whatever you want. He got. Huh? He, until he went out and, and saw the suffering on the street, then he wake up. But even then, he went to become a monk. Huh? Also, it's not like you have to go out to work, fighting with the world for some more sort of food and a few rest on your body. That's a different suffering. But the Buddha has been determined to be enlightened in order to help sentient beings. That was also a very hard job. But it's a different. He doesn't roll in the traffic jam in the early morning when you still, your eyes still not open just to go out to work. Otherwise you don't have breath on your face. Hmm? And at that time he doesn't have to breathe pollution air like the way we do now which contaminate our body, weaken our resistance, blur our mind. We have all this now. You have all this now. Apart from all the hardship you have to endure every day in your life. So if the Buddha were born again in this lifetime with you in your center, in your generation, and have to un- undergo all this hardship, then probably he would be more lenient. But of course, you must remember, he's talking to the monks, yeah? To the, the assembly of monks who is already our heart, who is already pure, already left everything behind and has the fortune to be cut off from all the mundane obligations, trouble and temptation. All they do is just take their bowl, go around in the village, have whatever they have, come back, eat their food, meditate, listen to the Buddha, living a very, uh, not too bad life. Even though maybe to bake and eat only once a day, maybe it's unimaginable to you. But you get used to it. And if you have no choice, that's probably be good. Yeah, I'm telling you. Because they'll be busy with some other things, you know? They will answer other lay disciples to come and ask. The, the lay disciples don't always ask the Buddha. Eh? The Buddha is not always available. He has to go to Samadhi. He has to meditate. So maybe they ask Ananda, they ask other monks. So they're also busy teaching them. Hmm? And they're also busy remembering what Buddha teaching. Write it down and contemplate on it, you see? And when you're busy, you don't feel that hungry. If you want to slim down, I have a recipe. 
Huh? You want to hear? No. All of you are very skinny. You don't need. <laughs> really, you want? Okay, I'm telling you. It just do what I do. <laughs> Be a master. <laughs> Busy yourself so much that you just eat half a bowl and then you have to, to, wait, to run for the phone, run for the dog, run for everything, and then you lost your appetite and you won't eat no more. That's also a good method. Yeah, yeah because I was having appetite. I was enjoying my food. But then I had to, to, to work because of deadline and other things at the working time. And then after I finish that, I don't feel any appetite anymore. I don't feel like I, I would want to enjoy that food anymore. Yeah? 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 No? No. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you would have had similar situation, right? <laughs> yes, huh? Yes. Don't tell me that I don't teach you everything. I do. <laughs> Even the house will slim down. <laughs> right. Ah, we continue. Until, until I prove to you why the Buddha is vegan, not vegetarian. And probably Jesus was vegan too, okay? It's just that uh, he didn't say anything or there's no trace of it. So we just presume that he was vegetarian. Yeah? Because a seen supposed to be vegetarian, okay? But mostly vegetarian, they ate pure food. You know, not like nowadays, they eat fish and seafood, you know, the shrimp and stuff, and they call themselves vegetarian. I said, what kind of vegetable that swim around in the sea like that? Huh? What, what kind of vegetable that swim around? <laughs> yeah? Have a face? Breathe in and out? <laughs> and go to eat? <laughs> and blinking eyes, waking tail and stuff like that? What kind of vegetable is that? Huh? You see, the swim, they, the swim, they also swing their tails to swim. The, the fish also swing in their fins and all that to swim. What kind of vegetable is that? Fred, is that a vegetable? No. No. See, telling you. They call them Japanese vegetarian, eating all that. <laughs> so, it's not like when the Buddha or even Jesus ate vegetarian. Mm. Maybe they probably drink a little milk here and there when, when they're sick, or if people even offer it to them, okay? The monks, they come out for arm, yeah? But the Buddha say if there's meat in the bowl, you take the meat out and eat the, the vegetables, okay? So, it's not that easy to just go out and, and bake and, and eat anything. It's not like that. And most people, I don't, I don't think they pour the milk on top of all the vegetables and rice when they give it to the Buddha. So milk is not always like available. It's not that. So even if they are vegetarian, it's very unlikely that they even have a chance to have milk. So nowadays, if they drink milk, eat egg, even they call themselves vegetarian. I don't think they offer that to Buddha. Even offer the Buddha, say take it aside. I will show it to you soon. You know why? I tell the SMTV staff to change the Buddha into vegan, not vegetarian. I mean, I mean, keep it, keep it. The calendar is still on. <laughs> yeah, you're a master. Huh? And talk, huh? Ooh. I can also go back to my room also. I wasn't really, like, very enthusiastic to come out and talk to you. Of course you are here already. I feel I should, yeah? Well, I was very, very, uh, not very strong. Not very, like... Oh, you know, I'm going out to talk now. Would I know I wasn't very good? Okay, a lot of working, rushing before the retreat, so that I can go to the retreat. Even the last minute, this early morning, four o'clock, they still send documents for me, and I work until I don't know eight o'clock, eight thirty. I mean, all night already. I don't four o'clock, I can go to take a rest. No, cannot. Hey, even I'm on retreat and they send it to work. Imagine that. Yeah. And then all kind of irregular activity, you know? Make the body kind of well. Huh? Not that I don't love you. I really love to see you. Absolutely. And now I'm here, I feel like, okay, I could talk. But when I come back to the room, it may be a different <laughs> dimension. <laughs> Not like I'm really enthusiastic to come out and Forget the calendars and that stuff, it's not good. Really <laughs> but I could go on with you around. Huh? I guess you're enthusiastic 
uh, uh, spirit, na, your love, and your hoorah, and clapping, all that, you know, good for the ego. And then they say, oh, it's a, it's a lot of rewards. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just love <laughs> That's the only drive, okay? That's the only drive that, that makes me drive this body. Yeah. How can you keep driving your body for many days on end without sleeping and eating just uh, something? Or not eating? You know, how can you drive your body like that? It's only love that can do that. Yeah? Only love, I think, that can do that. Love drives mm? I deserve it, shameless me. But just like the parents, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, now that I'm talking to you and I ask that question, I'm just thinking to myself, it's just like the parents love the children so much that they spend sleepless nights taking care of their ill children and go to work endlessly, two, three jobs even, just to afford them to go to college. Even just doing normal job, it's not like a very high paid job. Doing two paid job, going to sleepless night and eating on the road and enduring all kind of hardship or humiliation just to put the children into easy life and to college or to education or whatever they, they can afford. Yeah? I think it's like love, it drives you. Even if you're dead, you get up again. <laughs> Could be. So even when I'm coming out talk to you or when I go out on a lecture tour, the way I talk to people would think, Oh, she loves this job. Ah, she is strong and healthy and oh, very energetic. It's not hundred percent true. It's not. <laughs> All right. Uh, continue. Further, Ananda if living beings in the six paths of any mundane world has no thought of killing, he explained further, what's next, okay? After lust, what's next? That drives beings to re-migrate, uh, yes? Again and again in this uh, vicious circle of life and death. So if the beings in the six class, the six class now including humans, okay, and the diva, yeah? And what else? Buddhist? Six that are okay. Then Asaro. Ayo. Then Sima. Nuns. Yes? Hmm? Okay. Okay. I'm certified with the nuns here already. All right. So that means, nevertheless, for the Asura, meaning the astral beings, the first word that we have to pass is the astral world, yeah? And the beings there, we call them astral beings or Asura. Asura, Sanskrit term for astral beings, you know? It's astral beings, but they are also very uh, benevolent astral beings as well. Meaning these beings, whether or not they are benevolent or vicious, they are Asuras. And they also inside of this sick existence, which can, cannot escape birth and death and destruction, old age and etc. If they don't stop killing, killing directly or indirectly is the same. Hmm? Because if you don't eat meat, for example, then no one will kill the animals for you. Huh? What? Well, anybody so crazy will go buy a lot of animals and then kill them and just leave it there? Huh? Making no money? It is the money that drives people to raise animals and kill them for food. To so sell it to the people who eat it. Huh? If people cease eating them, then there will be no more killing. Right? So eating meat is a kind of also indirect food. Right? It support that kind of job. It support that kind of business yeah, of killing. So the Buddha says, all these beings, in including some lower level of heaven, if they see, if they have no thoughts even, not just killing, but thoughts even. Yeah. That's why the Buddha said you have to collect your thoughts, see? Because if you collect your thoughts, then you know, you control your thoughts, then you don't do the wrong thing. Yeah? That's why. Concentrate on the virtue and moral. 
and compassion and love. So the Buddha said, if these six past uh, beings do not have any thought of killing, they would not have to follow a continuous succession of births and deaths. If you don't kill, you will not die. I reborn again and suffering old age and sickness and separation and sorrow and all kind of pain. So killing is one of the cause of transmigration, yeah, after lust. Yeah, I don't know why the Buddha mentioned lust first. I guess it's because it's the assembly of monks, yeah. Monks, they don't kill anyway already, yeah. So lust is more important for monks. Because monks and nuns, when they came to the Buddha, they were still in the prime of their youth. And these hormonal drive that makes them crazy, make all of the young people trouble. That's why the Buddha mentioned it first. I, I guess. Okay, my humble opinion. Don't look at the current. <laughs> my humble opinion again. All right. I have to make it more plain, okay, and explain to you. Because if you read the sutra, some of it are really oh, out of understanding. You can't understand a thing. That's why many people don't, they say they follow such and such religion, but they don't understand what is it, the principle of the doctrines of their faith. Because the masters has long ago left our world, and they're teaching at that time. Their talk are also a little different from nowadays. It depends on the master. If uh, the master talk in the very high language, it's more difficult even. And not to talk about these kind of abstract terms, yeah, it's more difficult. And in such a way that not many people can understand. So if I talk a lot, it's just to make it more plain, okay? The calendar is useful, but your understanding is you know, also <laughs> very necessary, yeah? So if you read uh, Sutra alone, it may be very difficult, okay, to understand. Sometimes I read it uh, a little different in a plainer language. Your basic purpose of cultivating Samadhi is to transcend the wearisome defilement. But if you do not renounce your thought of killing, you will not be able to get out of the dust. The Buddha means after lust, if you already conquer the lustful mind, but still, you already cut off defilement in one department. But if your mind still doesn't cut off the thought of killing, or violence, or harm to others, then uh, you don't get out of the samsara that. Samsara, this world that. Okay, then it's not in again and again in the dust. And carrying this dusty body, which is made of dust. Buddha say like that, meaning you can never get out of the physical existence. This is dust. Anyway, I decorated the logic to make it beautiful dust, but it's still dust. <laughs> Just to make it pleasant to your eyes. I don't know, I keep asking heaven, I'm older now. Can I just wear everyday plain like gray, brown? Oh, you know, like those uh, dim yellow. Ah, oh, dark and red, even if red. Can I just wear two or one kind of color every day? They say, no, carry and carry and your usual self. Speak in English like that. You with yourself. <laughs> the former vice president of Taiwan, she's a practitioner of Buddhism. She's vegetarian. Very good, very good person. And now she, she sometimes talks very good about me somewhere else. I heard. I haven't heard it myself, but somebody told me that. And then one time she came to visit our ashram in Sihu, if you can call it ashram. I call it trees, uh, trees, and uh, planted trees area, no? There's nothing there you can go and ask. A ram, or maybe ash, okay, but <laughs> ram, I don't know. <laughs> that is the kind of ash also, you know, right? <laughs> okay, so ash, ram. <laughs> All right, then uh, she asked me whether if uh, in the practicing, you know, is a clothes, dress, is very important or not? Of course, everybody knows I was very flowery dressed, huh? <laughs> not like 
ordinary, not like other nuns. So they ask me that question. I think all the disciples of her or follow her don't dare ask her. She asks for them. They say, is it important the dress if you are practicing, you know, nuns? I say not important, of course. But it is very good to wear nun, nuns and monks robe. People leave you alone. Mm? At least they don't come and flirt with you. They don't try to tempt you. Then you cut off one of the temptations. The less the better. And then you don't have any hair anymore, then you don't need a comb. I oh, save a lot of money already. So the comb sometimes broke. You don't have to buy new one. And you don't have to wash a lot. And even if you wash, you don't even have to worry about blowing. Then you have another hair blowing machine. It has another expense. And, and I come with some luggage. And also, oh, what else? And you don't have to wash it very clean, clean or not clean. It doesn't look so much difference because it's gray, brown color, you know, or black. Yeah, I don't see much of the <laughs> of the stain. Yes. And every everywhere you go, you just take a very small suitcase. In the Himalaya, even after some years, of, I still carry just a very small. Those that the monks and Buddhist monks and then carry around them. Yeah, small bag, soda, carry some. And I put my second clothes in it. And when I was in Himalaya, I wear only white, you know, symbol, symbol, Punjabi, they too. I very simple. So I'm glad to come here so I can leave those behind at least. And then now they bring it here. I did not say anything. I did not want to. I just bring a few and I thought that's enough. I can keep changing, you know. No, they brought some here. <laughs> I'm telling you. You cannot run away. If you want one banana, you get the whole tree. Okay, never mind. I go with the flow. <laughs> and make lemonade out of lemonade. But wearing mango and nun drop is very nice. Very comfortable. The color, it just gray. <laughs> make you feel very comfortable. Like homie, yeah? When I wear those uh, in other time, I feel very comfortable. You don't worry. You, don't, you feel very comfortable. Light. Simple. Yeah. Just, just feel homey, yeah? Somehow. Mm. The color. Brown, you know, dirt brown or, or gray. You feel very comfortable in it. Try it. Mm. Next time. <laughs> or maybe it's just your attitude. It's just one of the simple. It's different. Maybe it's not the clothes, yeah? Or one time when I was younger. It's the color that feels that When I was younger, I was in Germany. Uh, I talked to a monk, you know, he's a very virtuous monk. He was already 60-something at that time. I was maybe 29, 30 at that time. I asked him I want to become a monk. Yeah. He said, why? You're doing well in the world. You're helping the Buddhism, you know, you're doing good for the temple, and you uh, help the monks and the nuns. You're doing well. You don't have to be a monk. And then, I said, but I like it. In the world, we had to wear different clothes, you know, to go to work, and all oh, changing, all that, and complicated, yeah? Oh, you're laughing at <laughs> And he said, you don't know. Some monks also are complicated. Uh, he said to me, just wearing the clothes, a simple clothes, doesn't make you simple. He said like that. I just now remember, and it could be true. It could be true. But at least it's simple uh, physically, you know, you don't have to have a lot of luggage to take care of luggage. You know. Oh, moving house is really tiring, you know. Uh, just the other day I had to move something here, yeah? Because you are here, you know. So I have to move some of this uh, theater, welcome stuff. Yeah. Here. And I had to do it all alone. Because I don't... Have in that situation over there, I cannot ask anybody to help me. Also, maybe they don't know what I want, okay? So I had to do everything myself, sorting things out, and then pack it, and then I have to select this and that, and I thought, oh, can I do all this? Oh, can I, can I? Very tired. <laughs> so bothersome. And I remember with kind of sadness, regretfulness, when I remember the time of Himalaya, when I have only two pair of bunjaslo, pajama like and of course some inner clothes and socks. That's all I have. And go all the way to the Himalaya. Go and cold weather. Because when you walk, you, you're very warm. All the people who were on the horse, but look at me like, like I'm a saint, you know? 
Yeah, she's saying. Yeah. <laughs> because a girl who go along in India, India is not safe, you know that? And they only two pair of clothes, a thin in cotton, you know, the Indian cotton. And only one pullover, but I don't ever wear it because I'm hot when I feel hot when I'm walking all day, it's too hot. Even when the rain make my clothes wet, I still feel very warm. And the snow is still abound. The month of May is still a lot of snow around. The army has to cut through the snow in order for the, for the children to walk. Like a two, two walls of snow over on a, a boat I would do when you walk. Like the wall of snow. In some part, man. Yeah? Oh, anyway, it's still cold. I never felt cold. That's why some people, they look at me and they come and want to take me home to worship. <laughs> and they, one guy wants to marry me, remember? He's younger, he's not graduated as a lawyer yet, and he wants to marry me. I was already 30, 31 or something. I said, I'm married and I'm older than you. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. And he's very good looking. Yeah. That was all time, huh? All time, all time. I uh, didn't fancy him, don't think about it. No, no. He's just telling you. No. I'm just telling you, it's a fool. He just so fun. <laughs> just so fun. I guess they think I am kind of holy or something. Yeah? A girl alone, an Asian, so small. And skinny and walk alone with one stick and sleeping bag and the clothes I put inside the sleeping bag, you know, one pair of clothes and the pair I wear, you see? And I put over also inside the sleeping bag and I roll it. So it, it looks like I have no luggage at all, just a sleeping bag. So they think I'm a kind of war. <laughs> Magical power, powerful something, deity of some kind, you know, manifesting just to test them or <laughs> something. <laughs> In the view, they're very pure. Yeah. No, if they walk down from the horse and walk like me, then they don't need anything more. So even though one may have some wisdom and manifestation of Chan Samadhi, you know, if you meditate, you have some wisdom, come out of it, and some Samadhi. But if one does not see his killing, one is certain to enter the path of spirit, meaning kind of goes and deep. Diva, demon, huh? Low diva. Not, not Buddha, not Bodhisattva, not sainthood. So, he say further, at, at best, in, you know, the best for you, even ever, that a person will become a mighty ghost. Wow. How awesome. <laughs> a mighty ghost. If, on the average, one will become a flying yaksha. Oh, at least you can fly. <laughs> yaksha. <laughs> Meaning a ghost leader or a kind, okay? Just a ghost. Uh, at the lowest level, one will become an earthbound rakshasa. Called like ghostling or something like that. Anyway, kind of ghost. <laughs> You're different a kind of ghost, they're all ghosts. Now you know why. The Buddha, the war honor one, the enlightened master, he said that. If you don't see his killing, meat eating, blood drinking, then you will become ghosts. Mighty ghosts even can fly, fly, but nothing else. Right. So beware, yeah? Five precepts, yeah? Hmm. No lying, no killing, yeah? Ah, it's coming next. So the one lying coming next. These ghosts, and spirit have their groups of disciples, also even have disciples. Each says of himself that he has accomplished the unsurpassed way, it's the same like the other one. After my extinction, meaning the Buddha, Nirvana, in the Dharma and in age, these hordes of ghosts and spirits will abound, spreading like wildfire as they argue that eating meat will bring one to the body way. They argue. These uh, ghosts and spirits, they say, if you eat meat, you still can 
you know, you will go on the Bodhi way, meaning you go in the Buddha's direction. You will become the Buddha. My God, what nonsense. How can anybody believe that? But somebody does, huh? Obviously. Okay. You want some more? Yes. No? Okay. Until midnight. Max, okay? 27 minutes. You can make use of the calendar sometime. Ananda, the Buddha continues to talk to Ananda. Ananda, I permitted the bhikkhus, I mean the monks, in the earlier days, to eat five kinds of pure meat. This meat is actually a transformation brought into being by my spiritual power. I mean the Buddha manifested it, used his power to make the meat for these bhikkhus because they probably live in an area where the vegetables don't grow or they are not used to it, or maybe they are sick or something, or nobody give them the vegetarian food, something like that. So the Buddha manifested some so-called meat to give to these uh, bhikkhu, the uh, monks, yeah? So it basically has no life force, fake meat, yeah? And nowadays they are also trying to make that. <laughs> you Brahmins live in a climate so hot and humid, and on such sandy and rocky land that vegetables will not grow. I was right. The vegetable cannot grow there. So the Buddha manifests it for his disciples, monks who eat. Mm. Therefore, I have had to assist you with spiritual powers and compassion because of the magnitude of this kindness and compassion. What you eat that tastes like meat is merely said to be meat. In fact, however, it is not meat. See that? Oh. Same in the Bible. God has also manifested manna. Yeah? Probably God at the time was manifested in a physical form as a master. In the Bible, God manifests manna for them to eat. And then one time, uh, God so-called is disciple or believer of God, also asked him, God mockingly. In the old time, it say that you manifest the manna to our ancestors to eat. Why don't you manifest meat for us? Yeah, and God did manifest meat. Rain down meat for them to eat. And after that, he destroyed them all. So in the Bible also say meat for the belly, belly for the meat. But God shall destroy both meat and them. So both of this uh, um, religion that I'm, I am acquainted with say the same thing, more or less. Except that the Buddha lived a very long life. He preached over 80 years, so he can tell many things that he knows. And even then he said, what I told you, he said to his disciples, what I told you, just uh, 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 some leaves in my hand compared to the forest. Yeah, of course, so many things he cannot explain in human's language. I cannot show them in the mundane vision. How can the Buddha say everything? Except you yourself become Buddha and experience it yourself. Okay? So he say, what I told you is just a handful of leaves compared to the forest leaves. Whoa, imagine how little it is, yeah? And then we have so many sutras already. This is just one of them. It's just one of them, and so big like that. And what I tell you now, it's just a portion of it, a small portion. And then I select what's good for you only, not too many things, okay? All right, but if I have time, maybe i check out more, whatever, maybe good for you, okay? Or maybe the other sutra, like Lotus Sutra, other sutra also very, very good. All the Buddhist sutra are very good. So he said, it tastes like meat because of I manifest it, but it's not real meat. It has no life force, no killing. Just it nowadays, like we eat uh, vegetarian meat, vegan meat, huh? it tastes very good. 
the texture and all that looks like maybe similar to hamburger, but it's not. There's no killing in it. No life force in it. Even the Buddha manifests, there's no life force of even vegetable. After my extinction, after Buddha's nirvana, mean he, after he passed from this world, after my nirvana or extinction, how can those who eat the flesh of living beings be called the disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha? He asked, you know, he said, how can anybody? After he died already, nobody manifests the fake meat for them. So if anybody eat meat, they are not disciples of the Buddha. I told you before in some of my lectures that Buddha said that. It is here, okay? If you don't believe me, you go home and get the Surangama Sutra, page 163, you read it. So this is true, huh? What I said before, that the Buddha said this, said that, is true also. You should know, the Buddha continued, you should know that these people who eat meat may still gain some awareness and may seem to be in samadhi even. But they are all great rasaksa, lower groups. Not even, uh, you know, diva in the, in the heaven. Not even diva in the in lower kingdom. Not even asura. It's a rasaksa. You know, low ghost. It's a magical power of me. When their retribution ends, they are bound to sink into the bitter sea of birth and death again. They are not disciples of the Buddha. Such people as these kill and eat one another in a never-ending cycle. How can such people transcend the triple realms? The triple realm is the Asura and the second world and the third world even. You know, after you you transcend the third, the three worlds, then you can be forever liberated. The four levels, okay? Or you can say that they cannot transcend the three uh, existence, like the hungry ghost and the hell and the uh, vicious animals' birth. Not all animal births are from the common, okay? But some are. Whew. Mm, okay, I am almost there. <laughs> oh, for so many. Oh, 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 oh. oh my God. <laughs> I thought I can end with the economics. And that's not included my calendar talk. <laughs> I don't know if you can sleep tonight. <laughs> if we don't cut it off now. <laughs> All right. Okay, tell me when you had it, then we'll go sleep, okay? Then uh, we can talk again tomorrow. We have seven days, right? That's why you're clapping. You confuse my ego now. What is it? You like me talk or you don't like me talk? Yes or no? Yes, don't like? Yes, like. <laughs> okay, I know. Just joking. I don't know what you like. <laughs> Best is that CPA 24 7. <laughs> talk whatever, right? Play the talker. Peace in Korea, whatever. You like it all. Okay, Buddha continue. When? He said to Ananda, because Ananda said he wanted to save sentient beings, remember? Yes. And he asked the Buddha, how can he do that? Yes. So now the Buddha concluded, more or less, not they concluded, but I he concluded when I concluded. It's not yet. <laughs> Therefore, Ananda, if when you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must also cut off killing the people, not just the monks and nuns, yeah? So they, the people in the world, must also cut off killing. This is the second clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the first come ones and the Buddhas of the past, the world honor ones of the past. Meaning all the Buddha, all the saints, teach this way to all people, yeah. either now or the past. That's what the Buddha said. 
So the Buddha said, therefore, Ananda, if cultivators of Chan Samadhi, mean the meditation, the way you do, do not cut off killing, they are the one who stops up his ears and calls out in a loud voice, expecting no one to hear him. It's like he stops his ear, <laughs> but he talks very loud and yell loud and then thinking nobody hears him because he himself doesn't. Yeah. And you know everything, my God. <laughs> what for I'm talking? Huh? You come up here. <laughs> All right. Very good. Because when you stuff your ears, yeah, and you don't hear even if you talk loud, okay, or anybody talk loud. When you stuff your ear and then you talk loud and then you think nobody hears, you won't disturb anybody anyway. And that is not correct. That's not logical. That's what the Buddha meant. Just an example to make it more clear explanation to Ananda. The Buddha is very patient, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. He keeps saying this, saying that, exhausting all kind of explanation, taking his time so that his disciple understand, understand well, you know, and not just understand but understand well. Because the example is more clear, yeah, than just talk. Because he stuffed his ear and expected no one to hear him. It is to wish to hide what is completely evident. <laughs> Say it is very illogical that you eat meat and you will become Buddha. How can you kill someone and live? I mean, eternally. That's what Buddha means. It's not reasonable, not logical. So, bodhisattvas and bhikkhus, I mean monks, who practice purity will not even step on grass in a pathway. Even less will they pull it up with their hand. How can one with great compassion pick up the flesh and blood of living, moving beings and proceed to eat it to his still? <sighs> the monks in the Hinayana Buddhist country, such as you know, some of the Asian country, they are in a Hinayana a way of Buddhist life, of Buddhist monk. You wouldn't think that they eat a lot of meat, but it's not like that. Except the monks and, uh, who have many uh, followers, and may, maybe they bring meat to the temple and offer it to the, the monks. Otherwise, they go out every day, once a day, in the morning, just to go for arm and the people give them whatever they eat. Okay? I saw that it's not much meat though. I don't see meat and at all. I just see some rice and vegetables. And to be a monk like that, eat once a day and go out bake for food and eat whatever people give is not a very comfortable life, physically speaking. Okay? So it's, it's a very hard practice very high discipline. I saw them using their hand, like the people who offer food, they don't just use spoon, you know. Outside, when these monks from other Asian countries come out to beg for food, people just use their hand and take some, uh, a pinch of rice and put it in the bowl, because they go in a, right, uh, a whole uh, line of, of monks, yeah? And mostly I see young monks, you know, children must come out and they use their hand. Uh, God knows if they wash them or not. They use their hand to pick the rice from their pot and give one pinch to each monk. And to the next one, the other would give some vegetables. And I don't know how much they get in a bowl from that. But it's not seemed to be a lot. So if you think to be a monk is an easy job, a lazy job, uh, just uh, don't want to work and go out back for good, it's not true, okay? Even the Hinayana monks, they don't just uh, have a good life like that, the way you think, okay? Come out and beg for food and people just use a hand with their chicken and give it to them like that. Some use spoon, but not all, I saw it. It uh, requires strength, discipline, and strong faith. May the Buddha's blessing as well.
Because these uh, Asian countries, they, they follow strictly the Buddha's way. And when Buddha was alive, they go out for arm, okay? They don't do business, they don't cook for themselves, they don't demand things, they go out for food. People give them what they eat, and they eat what they eat, together. And they don't wear shoes also. They just have uh, two pair of uh, man rope maybe, and maybe a blanket, but nothing more. Can you live like that? No. No, honestly not. For me, maybe not. Uh, the question of hygiene is already to begin to start my problem. But maybe if I have to, maybe I can. Well, I'm not sure about that. I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I go out to buy something to eat. Like I say, I want this bread, I want this bread. And if the vendor use her hand, you know, to pick out the bread, I said, no, no, I don't want that one. I want this one. I do it myself. <laughs> And sometimes if she use uh, the same knife that she cut the meat, and she cut my other thing, I say, no, 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 oh, so sorry, no, no, I, I change my mind, I, 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 I go buy something else. Yeah. So I don't know if I go out, I can beg, and people just put anything in my bowl like that, and I don't know if I can eat without vomiting. All right, so you know my weakness now. <laughs> you caught me. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem when you talk a lot. <laughs> You you will talk about yourself also without you before you even know it. <laughs> and all your weakness come out, yeah? <laughs> all right. Have a laugh. Have a laugh at my expense. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> now, this is a part where I told you that Buddha was a vegan, okay? He said, Bhikkhus, means monks, monks and nuns, Bhikkhus who do not wear silk, not even wear silk, or leather boots. At that time, the Buddha already so clear. The big shoe who do not wear silk, or leather boots, or furs, or down from this country, or consume milk, cream, or butter, can truly transcend this world. Hear that? That's the talk of the Buddha. He doesn't even drink milk. He don't wear silk. Some monks are offered silk rope because silk can repel insects and uh, give you comfortable feeling summer or winter. Yeah. But it's made by dead silk worm. Understand? They put the silk worm in the boiling water alive and get the cocoon after that. Well, if you know all these kind of things, you don't want to wear anything. Oh, do wear something. <laughs> what I mean is those luxury stuff, you know, fur and all that. You see, they cut the seal to death, the baby seal to death, bleeding, and then get their fur. What for? You can wear anything else and keep warm, huh? And pretty. All right, now. Do you see that? So the Buddha say, if the monks who don't wear seal, who don't wear leather boots even, even the leather boots are not, you know, much of the cruelty. Yeah, it is, but they already kill the cows or the animals to eat flesh. And the leftover, they use, like the leftover, the discarded part, like the skin they don't eat, yeah? They use it to make boots. But even then, the Buddha said, don't wear it. Not to talk about killing and eat it, yeah? Eat the animal, alive or dead. So... Do not wear silk, the big shoe. He talked because this is all the, uh, the monk that he was talking to, yeah? But even then, even a, a monk who already renounced all the comfort in the world, family, wife, kids, money, fame, profit, renounce it all already, yeah? Already have a lot of merit, virtues, and already gained a good teaching with the Buddha, staying with the living Buddha every day. Still he tell you, don't eat meat, don't wear silk even, don't wear leather boots, don't wear down, you know, from the pluck, the feather from the birds, don't wear down from this country, don't consume milk, uh, don't consume cream, they made for milk, and butter, then you can truly transcend this world. You see, 
You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Not that I say, the Buddha said it here. I mark it with the star. Yeah. I read it long ago, I marked it. I thought maybe one day I'd tell you. But I thought you knew already. But then I said, why? Why not? Just reconfirm it with the authority figure. Maybe you believe it more. Oh, at least some people outside, you know, when they watch my lecture, maybe they can believe more. And leave the animals in peace. So, the Buddha continued. When they have paid back their past debt, they will not have to re-enter the triple ring ever again. If you don't wear silk, if you don't drink milk, if you don't take cream, if you don't wear down, if you don't uh, take butter, leather boots, then you never have to enter the circle of life and death again. Okay. Now, why, the Buddha asked, why? It is because when one wears something taken from a living creature, one creates conditions with it. Just as when people eat the hundred grains, their feet cannot leave the earth, cannot leave the ground. Yeah? Both physically and mentally, one must avoid the bodies and the byproducts of living beings by neither wearing them or eating them. I say that such people have true liberation. Bravo, Buddha. Thank you very much. One minute to midnight. <laughs> the Buddha said, What I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. He doesn't mean only his teaching, but he means the same teaching, the holy people's teaching, past and present, for him. So, when he said Buddha's teaching, he means general here, uh, uh, a third party. He doesn't mean himself. Yeah? So, what I have said here is the, the Buddha's teaching. Any explanation counter to it is the teaching of papaya, I mean the heretic, the non-believer, the evil. Okay, there are some more. Okay, we continue next time. Yeah, okay. so that you can go rest. Okay. Explain <laughs> more about the precepts. We should really thank the past masters, monks and nuns and scholars who had take time to record what the Buddha is teaching after the masters and nirvana. And also for the past and present persons, lay or monks or nuns who had really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas, past, present, and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you.